It's now time for question period, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, my, uh, thanks. my, my first question uh, this morning is uh, to the Premier. Speaker, families are watching in horror as COVID-19 outbreaks rip through another for-profit long-term care facility, Extendicare's West End Villa in Ottawa. Since first declaring an outbreak two weeks ago, the virus has infected 46 residents, and six residents have died. This is a facility with a history of police investigations and class action lawsuits. The Premier repeatedly talks about uh, lessons that have been learned and that long-term care homes are protected and that for-profit operators would be held to account. Despite all that talk and being warned months ago that this was coming, why are families once again watching another deadly outbreak in long-term care? Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. I want to make sure that um, that all of us understand that the long-term care homes in Ontario are often a reflection of the community surrounding them. In fact, there was an article in the Canadian Medical Association Journal uh, with Dr. Nathan Stahl indicating that it is not uh, that the outbreaks are consistent with the public health unit. Uh, rate of infection of COVID around those areas, and it is not reflective of, of the ownership of the home. Some of our homes have struggled. There is no doubt about that. And COVID is an invisible invader, and that's why we have the testing and process, testing processes we have. It's why, once it's into the home, we have to find it and we have to destroy it. And that's why we have the infection prevention and control teams coming in. It's why we have a coordinated effort with Ontario Health, Public Health Ontario, the Ottawa Public Health Units. And I'm in daily contact with, the, uh, with Ottawa Public Health to make sure everything that is... It's not, it's not mine. So in any case, I would suggest that we, we look at um, understanding the area and the communities, and this is why everyone needs to... Much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, all I can say to that is thank goodness that the rates of death are not the same in the community as they have been in long-term care. That was a horrifying response. The Premier talks about taking action, Speaker. He talks about it all the time. Two months ago, two months ago, after hundreds of residents had died in long-term care, the government's own report on long-term care staffing made very specific recommendations to address the challenges in long-term care including funding the and i quote urgently address funding rather to i quote urgently address urgently address the staffing crisis in long term care 2 months ago why has the government failed now then to provide the additional funding that has long been needed to increase the actual staffing and prevent the further outbreaks and deaths in homes like Extendicare West End Villa? When will it actually happen? When will his talk turn into action? Last members to take their seats. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and once again, thank you for the question. In fact, we have been acting. As soon as we became a Ministry of Long-Term Care in the summer of 2019, the staffing crisis was very evident, and we began working on that at that time. And all throughout this, we are preparing and managing a, a staffing shortage with every measure possible. This is a, a combined effort with the Ministry of Health. Uh, and the Ministry of Long-Term Care, understanding that more uh, needs to be done, informed by our expert panel uh, that did a study on staffing in long-term care to uh, provide us with a, a, a map for um, a long-term care staffing strategy, a comprehensive strategy, and that's exactly what we've been working on. We have been absolutely working round the clock, dedicated to this, looking at every Spons. avenue for staffing, and working with multiple ministries to uh, address this issue. It is ongoing, and we will continue to work on this. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Speaker, this government's lack of urgency on fixing long-term care has now led to another six deaths in the last couple of days. That is unacceptable, Speaker. It should be unacceptable for everyone sitting on the government bench. But the government's own report also recommended increased standards in long-term care, calling on the government to mandate, and I quote, 
four hours of direct care per resident as quickly as possible. Now, that was a couple of months ago. That was a couple of months ago, Speaker. Where are the four hours of long-term uh, of hands-on care? But instead of, of, of establishing that minimum or taking any steps whatsoever to address staffing shortages, the government has done nothing and is allowing the horrific cycle of outbreaks, infections, and deaths to continue in our long-term care system. How many more outbreaks need to happen in long-term care before this premier meets the staffing and care standards recommended by their their own advisors by their own reports. Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member opposite for the question. I am going to push back. Uh, it is absolute reality that we are actively, aggressively working on the staffing strategy, and the sense of urgency is absolute not only for the Ministry of Long-Term Care, but for this entire government and all the good people who are working tirelessly, whether it's in the public service, the front lines of our long-term care homes, or the hard-working MPPs and, and the people on your side as well who are working hard to do this. All of us, all of us must come together and collaborate and make sure that we do everything possible. And that is exactly what we're doing, and we will continue to work and take every measure. And I want to make sure that everyone understands that these homes are our focus. Uh, many of the homes Response. that are in outbreak have one staff member self-isolating at home. There are two homes in the Ottawa area, and we are pouring all our resources into those homes to shore them up and make sure that we put the priority of safety and well-being of residents and staff. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, to the Premier. You know, report after report from the front lines uh, confirmed that this government did nothing to prevent COVID outbreaks that robbed Ontarians of their loved ones in long-term care. And to those families, it looks like the Premier is doing all that he can do to actually protect a broken system. His government refused to hold a transparent public judicial inquiry into long-term care, instead trotting out their commission back in July. Two months later, families learned that the commission has only met in secret and will not commit to ever holding public hearings. The Premier promised in July, in his own words, quote, a transparent, independent review of our long-term care system. Does the Premier believe a commission that has so far only met in secret is actually transparent? <laughs> Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. I take uh, exception to the term secret. Um, I, as, a, as a dedicated family doctor for many years who's come to this chamber to advance long-term care and make sure our most vulnerable people get the care that they need, I take great exception to that comment. And I can tell you that the commissioners are eminent, eminent people. They are highly skilled, highly qualified, credible people, highly respected. And to say that meetings are being taken in secret is, is an absolute travesty. Our, the commissioners have the power to conduct hearings and deputations and issue summons to any person to give evidence and produce documents as they conduct their investigation. They will uphold transparency and they will get to the bottom of what happened. They will provide guidance Bonds. to our government as to what can be done differently. They will hear from residents, from families, and from staff members. They will provide the transparency that is needed, and I take great exception. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, that's great, Speaker. Then I expect the transcripts of every interview that has taken so far to be posted on the website. Yesterday, the minister stated on the record, and I quote, certainly there will be hearings. There is a public report, only to be contradicted literally within hours by the commission itself. Families and frontline health workers who had been promised concrete action and a transparent investigation are now dismissing this as a cover-up. And 
as meaningless as the Premier's promise of an iron ring around long-term care, which we all know never occurred. How can this Premier claim a transparent process when key interviews have been conducted in secret already? Families have been left in the dark. There is no commitment to holding public hearings, and the Minister of Long-Term Care can't keep her story straight by the looks of things. Mr. Long -term Care, thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the, the question. The Commission has the ability to conduct hearings, summons individuals or groups to gather information. It is an independent commission, and that needs to stay that way. We recognize the important part of getting up and getting going. And that's what they've done during the last month, establish a secretariat, establish a group of people to support them so that they can do their good work. Um, this is about transparency. We need to be informed as to what we can do differently. We need that objectivity. And that is what we'll, we'll, we will be providing, um, that avenue through the independent commission. As a minister, I am not in contact with the commissioners because it must be independent and transparent and nonpartisan. It's absolutely critical. And I, I respect the commissioners that have been appointed. They are highly respected in their fields. Uh, they are going to provide the trust that is needed. Thank you. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, I wrote to the commission about a week ago to ask about these issues specifically. And I got no response, no response until this morning after news broke that the Commission was conducting key interviews behind closed doors in secret. The Premier's hand picked Commission won't commit to public hearings, hasn't reached out to a single family yet, won't commit to providing any accountability or transparency. Will the Premier finally do the right thing today and call the fully transparent, independent judicial inquiry that should be already in place and at work? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you once again. We know from the just, Justice Scalise, the public inquiry uh, that she chaired and, and recommended uh, many recommendations after, that it takes a long time for an independent, for a, uh, a public inquiry to be done. An independent commission will provide us with the necessary efficient timelines that we need to address any possible additional measures that we can take. We cannot wait years. We cannot wait years. And there are even some groups saying that we already know what happened with ward rooms, with the capacity in our long-term care homes, the lack of redevelopment over decades of the previous government, 15 years, with which no essential significant development redevelopment occurred. Response. The neglect of our long-term care system by the previous government, occasionally and sometimes frequently propped up by the, the, by the uh, opposition, makes a difference to our vulnerable people. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, listening to claims made by the Premier and the Minister of Education this week, parents and educators could be forgiven for thinking they'd stumbled into some kind of alternate reality. Why else would the government repeatedly say they have reduced class sizes when what's happening on the ground is so clearly the opposite? Why would the government take credit for the enormously hard work that boards have done to reduce class sizes in a few, very few areas of high need? and claim that they'd done that across the province. In fact, what they've done is create utter chaos across this province. Mr. Speaker, the Premier owes parents and educators across this province an apology. He is leaving our buses and classrooms in chaos at a time when our children need more support and not more confusion. Will the Premier listen to the chorus of voices, including sick kids, and bring in class size caps of 15? The Minister of Education. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Speaker, our plan that we have unveiled has been fully endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health of this province. It's evidence-informed, and it is fully funded. It's comprehensive, and it leads the nation in, in each and every realm. Speaker, in the areas of classroom sizes, it is under the Premier's leadership that we have dedicated $200 million to enable school boards to, yes, hire more teachers, upwards of 2,000, funded by government, and funded by reserves, an additional up to 5,000 teachers could be hired through the unlocking of $496 million. The point, Speaker, is in each and every school board in this province, urban and rural, in every board, school boards are taking leadership to reduce those classroom sizes. In Toronto, in the higher-risk communities, and I've always been specific, in those communities, we're seeing absolute caps of 15 up to grade 3, absolute caps of 20 Response. up to grade 40. We'll continue to work with our boards to keep these classroom sizes safe and do everything we can to ensure the safety of our province. Speaker. Supplementary question. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I mean, the Minister of Education's response is utter fiction. Uh, the minister needs to go back and do the math on what this funding is covering, because it ain't covering that. Speaker, uh, if you talk to any educator, custodian, principal, parent, you're going to see classes are not being reduced to ensure physical distancing, because this government has not put up the funding to do it. This week, I heard from more parents. I've heard from thousands. Um, one parent shocked to find out that their child's class was collapsed into a supersized 28-person class. I've heard about 29, 35, 30, a grade 8 with a class of 35. Parents are trying to buy outdoor tents with their own money to help schools keep distanced. Some classrooms are being left empty. It's absurd. A bus driver told me yesterday she's been driving a full bus of 60 children to five Question. schools in two different boards since last week and only got her seating recommendations yesterday morning. Again to the Premier, will the government commit today to keeping our kids safe by capping class sizes at 15? Mr. Education reply. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in the Toronto District School Board, to date, the Director of Education has informed us that they're on track of hiring over 366 net new teachers to respond to this unprecedented challenge. In, that, in, that, in Toronto, for example, where the member opposite represents, there's been an additional, an additional 102 public health nurses, more than doubling the capacity to respond. Mr. Speaker, what we're seeing on the ground notwithstanding some of the pessimism of the members opposite is a real sense of unity of spirit in our province of educators and principals and administrators and public health units coming together to confront this challenge in the great tradition of our province speaker what we need now more than ever is a collective resolve to do our part and to work together in the public interest that's what our government will continue to do speaker next question the member for milton Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, not that long ago, during the darkest days of the COVID-19 pandemic, every country in the world was left scrambling for critical medical supplies and personal protective equipment. There was a worldwide shortage. Canada was left at the mercy of other countries for the PPE we desperately needed. A report by the province's Auditor General, completed in December 2017, found that more than 80 per cent of the stockpile equipment had expired under the previous Liberal government's leadership. Speaker, can the Premier inform the Legislature about what our government has done to ensure that Ontarians are never left in the same vulnerable position ever again? Premier. I want, I, want, I want to thank the, uh, our great member from, from Milton. You know, I, I'll never forget, Mr. Speaker, the, the day that uh, uh, the president decided to cut Canned Off, their number one uh, trading partner, number one customer, and uh, we called out for help. And the great, great companies of this province stood up. They ramped up. They switched over their lines, some of the largest companies, some of the smallest. Some people in their basement were, were making masks. But I'm proud to say, since everyone has stood up, we have dozens and dozens of companies making feel, uh, face shields. We have dozens of companies making face masks and hand sanitizer and surgical gowns. Companies switching over again. Canda Goose, what a great company, switched over to surgical gowns. So I, I'm proud to say in, in a short period of time, in less than three months, we are self-sufficient. We will never have to rely on a foreign leader, a foreign country ever again for our PPE. Not only Response. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is back to the Premier. Premier, thank you for your strong leadership during some of the most difficult times that we're facing. I remember in the early days of the pandemic, stories about Ontario receiving contaminated products and having to fight with other countries for life-saving medical supplies. This demonstrated to everyone why Ontario needed to re-secure our supply chain and manufacturing strength once again. Speaker, can the Premier please share with the Legislature about the partnership announced yesterday between our government and Littermore to secure additional medical equipment for my constituents in Milton and all Ontarians as we continue our fight against COVID-19? Premier. Uh, th thank you very much to our great number. I'm, I'm going to back up for a second. I'm going to talk about our first announcement with 3M in, in Brockville. Now we have a supply of over 25 million N95 masks with a great partnership with 3M and the federal government and the province. We had a phenomenal meeting at Linamar. Going back months when everyone in the world was scrambling for ventilators, Mr. Speaker, we were able to partner up with O2, what another great company, and Linamar. Linamar is one of the largest and one of the best auto uh, part manufacturers in the entire world, employing 9,000 people up in the great city of, of Guelph. We went over there, and I, again, I'm proud to say, with the cooperation, the collaboration of our government and the private sector, they're producing 10 thousand ventilators. We'll never have to rely on any other country for ventilators again. We will have huh? a stockpile of ventilators, not just for us, but for our great neighbours, our provinces across this great country. So thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, London's two COVID assessment centres are completely overwhelmed. They are seeing the longest lineups in months, with people waiting four hours or more for a test or forced to leave without one. One of the centres is within walking distance of three elementary schools, creating safety and traffic nightmares for children getting to and from school. The Western University Mobile Testing Unit is turning students away because it can't meet the demand. Christine and Sue Zimmer told me their 87-year-old mother, who needs a test in order to get her cancer surgery, was forced to risk exposure to COVID by waiting in line for hours with people who were symptomatic. Speaker, with the second wave upon us, what is this government doing to reduce the risk and make more COVID tests available to Londoners? Premier. I want to thank uh, the member for, for the question. You, you know, Mr. Speaker, I stood up there day after day after day begging people to get tested, and people were coming. We're leading the country in testing. We, we have 50, 38 percent of the population, 52 percent of the test. We have well over 3,200,000 tests, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing, it's all hands on deck. We've reached out for help again because we aren't shy to ask for help from the great people, the 14.5 million people and the thousands of businesses. And again, the thousands of businesses are stepping up. Some of the top retailers in the entire country that I've called personally are stepping up and they're going to be doing the testing. And we look forward to making sure that everyone has an opportunity to get tested. I drove by Women's College, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm first to acknowledge there, there was lineups, but there was good news in that. Lineup. The good news is I saw a lot of young people in that lineup because we know the majority of the cases are under 40 years of age and also Response. under 19 years of age. So I'm so proud to see everyone getting there and getting tested, and we're going to have a very efficient system. And the supplementary question. Speaker, an effective and appropriate testing strategy requires more assessment centres, longer hours, more options for testing. Ron Quintillan and his sisters need tests every two weeks to visit their father in long-term care. They worry that lineups for testing mean they won't be able to see their father and are planning to take vacation days in order to wait for the tests. Brenda D'Souza told me that her elderly parents are scheduled to move into a, re a retirement home but may have to delay delay their move because of long waits for a COVID test. Speaker, with students back to school, with the situation in London is going to get much worse very quickly. Will the Premier commit to providing the resources that London urgently needs to expand our testing capacity and help limit the second wave? Minister of Health to reply. 
much, Speaker. Well, the good news is that more people are going for tests. That's what we ask people to do, people that have symptoms and people that believe they may have been in contact with someone with COVID-19. We are very pleased that they're coming Order. forward, but they also deserve to have time. Stop the clock. Order. Please restart the clock. Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. But people also deserve to have timely access to tests, and we recognize that with people going back to work, with people returning to school, people needing to have tests to visit uh, family members in long-term care homes or retirement homes, that we need to have greater access for people. We have expanded our testing capacity and our lab capacity considerably in a very short order to the point that we are now leading in testing across the country with over 3 million tests having been conducted. But we are looking to expand again. We're looking to get to 50,000 tests per day, and we have a fall preparedness plan that is calling for that to happen. We are actively looking at this moment at ways that we can expand Response. access to people, not just in London, but across the province, because we know there are long wait lines in other places. But we're very grateful, first of all, to our hospital partners. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's good to be free. My question is for the Premier. In March, the government implemented emergency orders shutting down Ontario's economy, including places of worship. Initially, we were told this would last for two weeks in order not to overwhelm our health care system. Six months later, we expect many businesses will close permanently as a result. I've heard from many people across our province concerned with the lack of clarity provided with regards to transparent benchmarks and objective criteria being used by the province and local officials in their imposition of emergency powers. This week, the Premier stated that a second shutdown is being considered on specific regions of the province as a result of a week that saw an increase in the number of positive COVID cases being reported. For the sake of transparency and clarity, has or will the government create a general framework that they can share with the people of Ontario with objective criteria, like the rate of increased cases and the duration the increase needs to persist, before a second shutdown is considered or imposed on the province or on specific regions, or will such a decision be made on a gut? Question. Recognize the Solicitor General. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, we're going to continue what we have done in, since the beginning, and that is listen to experts, get that information from the command table, from medical experts who understand what COVID-19 is as those emerging uh, issues come forward, as we see that we're learning more about what COVID does, what the pandemic can do within our community, um, frankly, killing people. Uh, we need to make sure that we listen to those experts and act quickly, which is why Ontario was the first jurisdiction in all of Canada to declare the declaration of emergency, because we knew Premier Ford understood the need to act quickly to protect our communities. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bill 195 gave this Premier the unilateral ability for the next year, and possibly two, without debate amongst Ontario MPPs, to impose a second province-wide or regional shutdown at any time. The Premier could hold on to these powers right up until the next Ontario election. Therefore, it is important that the government provide consistency and clarity to the people of Ontario. Just this week, the Premier stated that despite the source of the most recent increases in positive COVID cases being social gatherings and not activities related to workplaces, he was considering a second shutdown for affected regions. Yesterday, the Premier said new measures are on their way. Earlier this month, the Premier stated that local officials are free to impose more restrictive limits on gatherings as they deem necessary. My question for the Premier is, is the government considering imposing a second broad shutdown of specific affected regions, even where the increases are due to social gatherings? Or will the government's new measures be more targeted and ensure that any tightening or furthering of restrictions will be done based on a framework with objective criteria? Again, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. I would have thought that the member opposite understood the legislation that, in fact, it has a one-year time frame. Unprecedented. I cannot think of another piece of legislation that we have tabled in this province that has a timeline of one year. If it is deemed necessary to extend that. It would be voted on and debated in this chamber as it should be. But, it, you know, I want to come back to we need to listen to the experts. We need to understand how this is impacting our communities, our businesses, our uh, friends and family, and we need to make sure that we do everything possible to keep people safe and sound. It is 
at its core what government must do, and I'm proud of how we've been able to do that so far. Uh, it, it's an emerging issue. We're learning more as the medical experts continue Response. to share that information, and we need to react and respond when they share it. Thank you. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and nice to see you this morning. Speaker, uh, my first question is actually for the Minister of Education. I want to say thank you for all his generous time speaking directly twice to my constituents, parents, teachers, and students. <laughs> We had questions with regard to the education system. Mr. Speaker, I know that parents, students, and teachers in Etobicoke Lakeshore are tracking the daily COVID numbers in our province. We all are. But I also know that we have confidence in our government, and our government has created a robust return to school plan backed by $1.3 billion in investments to support a safe reopening. A big part of that plan includes a comprehensive outbreak management protocol document. Speaker, can the Minister of Education please tell the legislature why it is in such an important tool in our fight against COVID-19? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for her solid leadership, for her community, as well as for all students in this province who want to go to school and be able to do so safely. And, Speaker, when it comes to our plan to keep schools safe, we have two aims. The first is to prevent the spread, and the second is to act decisively when cases arise. Obviously, our focus, part of that one point, $3 billion allocation investment, a one-time investment to make sure schools are safe, is really premised on minimizing the risk to all children and maximizing their learning experience. Part of the guidance we provided makes very clear our expectations, that, there's, that they're constantly implementing these prevention measures, they're maintaining accurate records of staff, of students, and of visitors, that they're working with local public health authorities, and they're taking appropriate action when staff or students or visitors become ill during the day, including isolation, the use of PPE, and obviously for students going back to their homes. Speaker, we launched a website in this province, Ontario.ca forward slash reopening schools to provide data to parents on the COVID cases. We believe in transparency. We will do everything we can in this province to make sure our students are safe. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you. And uh, Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his answer. And I want to say how happy I am, especially as a parent of a daughter who is in grade 11, to hear our commitments of our government for such a strong plan to keep our children safe as they return back to school. I take comfort in the fact that our government has taken a scientific approach to reopening our province to ensure Ontarians remain protected. However, Speaker, we all have seen cases and how they have risen across this province over the last couple of days. And I do feel reassured knowing that we do have a world-class public health care system advising our government, and I thank them for their efforts. Can the Minister of Health please tell this House how the government plans to continue to protect Ontarians' health and well-being as the fall approaches and numbers continue to rise. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for your question and for your advocacy on behalf of your constituents. Due to the hard work of the people of Ontario, our province consider, continues to be a leader among many jurisdictions in the fight against COVID-19. However, there is no doubt that the latest trends in numbers have raised some concern, especially as we move into the fall months. We know that the people of Ontario don't want to see widespread lockdowns or shutdowns again. That is why we are taking the pause of four weeks before considering any further loosening of public health measures or opening any further businesses, organizations, or facilities. Additionally, we will be releasing our comprehensive fall preparedness plan very shortly, and this plan will continue to build upon the measures currently in place Spons. and introduce new and innovative actions that our province can take to continue to fight COVID-19. But the people of Ontario, Speaker can rest assured that our government will do everything we can to protect their health and well-being. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Kiewetnong. Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, it's good to be back uh, to represent uh, great people of Kiewetnong. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, First Nations have been very clear. It is disrespectful to bury legislation that affects our rights and our lands in omnibus bills like Bill 197. It is very disappointing why First Nations have prioritized keeping communities safe during this pandemic. Ontario felt it was appropriate time to pass an omnibus bill violating constitution, 
constitutionally protected Aboriginal and treaty rights. Mr. Speaker, why does this government conduct itself in a manner that disrespects and dishonors treaty relationships? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and thank you for the question from the member opposite. It, it is very important that we have our relationships uh, with, with those and the treaty rights. And, and uh, although I'm not, I'm not particularly aware, maybe I'll get it in the supplementary, about the specific issue that, that he's raising, I can tell you the, the Indigenous Justice Division within, within the Ministry of the Attorney General uh, and, and, of course, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, uh, we work closely with our, with our partners, uh, whether you know, it be Grand Chief Archibald. Uh, we, we're talking regularly with them about a whole variety of issues. We value the relationship. We value the input. Uh, it, it's, it's critical that we move forward in that, in that partnership and in the spirit of partnership. So I'm happy to chat, uh, talk with, with the member opposite any time, either in the House or outside of the House, about how we can, we can foster that relationship and how we can make it even better. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it, it's again critical to our government that we uh, work with our partners, and, and I look forward to the supplementary. The supplementary question. Miigwech. Name dropping leadership, First Nation leadership is not partnership. Yeah. Speaker, as a treaty partner, this government must learn to respect the treaty relationships before it is damaged beyond repair. I bring this up today because economic recovery from the effects of COVID 19 will not happen at the expense of our treaty rights and our lands. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, this is not open season on our lands, for our lands. The forest and the land is more to us as First Nations than the, than the source of money. Speaker, most of our communities in my riding are still in lockdown. They could not participate fully in any consultation uh, exercises or activities if there, if there was any while this pandemic was happening. Will the government act honorably to ensure that all First Nations can participate in your economic recovery activities. Miigwech. Thank you. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I agree wholeheartedly that just using names and, and, and flowery language doesn't actually make a partnership. It's what happens on the ground. It's the activities that we're doing, and just yesterday, the Minister of Northern Affairs talked about the mining sector, about the things that we're opening up, the partnerships that we have with First Nations. It's proof in fact. It's action. We, we're, we're not here to talk about things. We're here to do things, and we're doing that. We're doing that in the justice sector. The, the ways that we're reaching out and we're partnering with, with NAN and Treaty 3 and the, and the others. Mr. Speaker, I, I use names because I want to reinforce that there are individuals that we are working with very closely, and there are dozens of names that I'm not using. Uh, because that really isn't the point. The point is that we're taking action. It's in justice. It's in economic affairs. It's in social issues. It's in every way that we touch with First Nations and the challenges they have. And I can tell you through, through, the, through the justice system, Mr. Speaker, uh, the activities that, that we're, we're partnering with to solve long-standing issues uh, are, I'm very excited about. This government is taking action, and the proof is— Thank you very much. Next question, member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, for months, the Premier and his Minister of Health have been talking about the importance of testing as part of their COVID-19 strategy. But public health leaders, city councillors, our mayor, uh, members on this side of the aisle have all been pointing to the glaring lack of capacity in our nation's capital. Capacity is so bad, Mr. Speaker, that lines are forming hours before the testing centres open up. Imagine, wa imagine waiting four to six hours in line with your kids outside without washrooms, Mr. Speaker. Now imagine doing that in November and December in Ottawa. Uh, yesterday, residents in Ottawa were turned away from critical COVID-19 tests. When is the government going to release the billions of dollars in federal safe restart money to ensure that there are equitable and accessible testing capacity in our nation's capital? Minister of Health. 
Well, I thank the member very much for the question. And there, uh, it, it is a problem in several locations in Ottawa, I know, in Toronto, and other locations in across the province where people are having to wait for uh, inordinate lengths of time to have a test. We want them to be tested. Anybody with symptoms, anybody who believes they've been in contact with someone with COVID-19 needs to have a test, but it needs to be done, as I said before, in a timely manner. So we have expanded our testing capacity considerably since March when we were doing 5,000 tests per day. We've expanded that capacity so that we can now do 25 or 30,000 tests a day. We're going to increase that capacity to 50,000 tests per day because we want people to be tested and we are actively looking for ways to expand that, whether it's by expanding the hours or times that the 148 assessment centres are open or by opening new places for people to be tested. We're very Response. cognizant of this issue and we are dealing with it as we speak. And the supplementary question. Supplemental is also for the Premier, Mr. Speaker. Residents of Ottawa's suburban and rural communities have to drive so far to access COVID-19 tests that it's often uh, closer to drive to a neighbouring town, putting pressure on health systems in places like Rockland and Kempville and Armprior. Residents of, in Orleans have been calling for a local testing centre uh, since the spring, and I've heard the same calls from residents in Canada and Barhaven as well, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday on Moody Drive, hundreds of residents were waiting hours Order. on the side of a gro gravel shoulder road in Nepean for hours on a shoulder gravel road next to a very busy road waiting for their COVID-19 tests. Why do the residents of Ottawa's rural and suburban communities have to drive so far and wait so long to get a critical COVID-19 test? Minister Pell. Well, thank you again, but we have expanded the capacity significantly in a very short order, and we are going to ex significantly expand it again because we know that with people going back to school, with people returning to work, with people wanting to visit family members in long-term care homes or retirement homes, we have boosted the capacity significantly in the last short while, and we're boosting it again. We are making plans to expand both the testing capacity and the lab facilities because, of course, you need to have people be tested in, in uh, good time, but also to receive their results very quickly as well. So we want to make sure that people can receive the results within 24 hours. So we have plans to do that. Our fall preparedness plan is dealing with that. We are looking for those locations now, both in terms of expanding testing facility, but also our lab facilities, so that anyone in Ontario, in the Ottawa area or wherever else it may be, can receive those tests because we want people to be tested. We know that we're facing a, a wave two, and as well as flu season, so we need to be prepared for that, and we will be. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peter Bird. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Good to see you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. A minister, we recognize that individuals and businesses across Ontario have been significantly impacted by COVID-19. Despite the challenges ahead, I've really been inspired to see the collective commitment to working across Ontario to overcome these collective challenges. Locally, in my riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South, Minister, I recently spoke to our local chambers. As an example, I reached out to Brenda Whitehead. She's doing a phenomenal job with the Port Hope Chamber of Commerce. She spoke to me about important programs, Digital Main Street, Broadbend, the Recovery Activation Program, and the important work that those programs are doing to support local businesses. In fact, uh, Rhonda at Primitive Design is working actively in those programs as we speak. Could the minister please share with the House the actions our government continues to take to support individuals and businesses during these difficult times? Minister of Finance. So thank, thank you to the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you as well uh, to yourself and many of the other members of this legislature who have, have uh, welcomed me to your riding, a chance to speak to your businesses, to your community. Uh, you do an excellent job of representing their, their interests. Mr. Speaker, our government um, is, uh, is proud of the actions it's taken in collaboration with the 14.5 million Ontarians to support people, to support businesses, to support health care. Mr. Speaker, since the announcement of our first action plan, our $17 billion 
COVID Action Plan. That number has now increased to $30 billion, Mr. Speaker, $30 billion of direct support. And the member mentioned just one of those programs, uh, which, in partnership with my colleague, the Minister of Small Business, the Digital Main Street Program, to talk about that program, $57 million in partnership with the federal government to support the digitization of Main Street businesses, to support them as they evolve their businesses and move through this very difficult time. Mr. Speaker, with the member's help, with the help of all the members of this legislature, we'll continue to support our businesses with programs like Digital Main Street. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. It's heartening to know the important work that you're doing, that our government's doing to support our businesses during these difficult times. And we're continued. We will continue to commit to working with businesses as we go forward. I'm proud to be part of this government that's doing that. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I'm also a member of the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Mr. Speaker, they often say when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And I'm proud to say that this committee met with over 500 witnesses, 800 hours of testimony. Mr. Speaker, not one person was turned away, including the many local constituents of mine that spoke to this committee. So, Minister, could you please inform the House what other actions the government are taking to listen to the concerns of Ontarians as we move forward on a path to economic recovery? Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, again, thank you to the member. Mr. Speaker, as soon as this crisis hit, the legislature and, in fact, this government responded, and one of the ways we responded was by making sure we were listening. One of the ways that we did that was through the creation of the Ontario Jobs and Recovery Cabinet Committee. Mr. Speaker, the members of that committee set up 56 ministerial advisory councils. They've had over 600 meetings with groups to talk about specific sectors, about specific issues. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I would, I would want to thank not just the member from Northumberland, Peterman South, but all the members of the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. We spent <laughs> And Mr. Speaker, the over 500 witnesses who took their time to respond to the opportunity to share with us what it was that is going on in their communities so that we can respond. We can continue to respond through the programs we put forward, through the budget that we'll bring forward uh, by November 15th, making sure that we are listening to the challenges Ontarians are facing, the job creators are creating, the job creators are facing to support Ontario through this pandemic. The next question. The member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Last night I spoke to Robert Smiley, an Ottawa resident whose son Rowan and partner Kimberly must be tested for COVID-19 every two weeks, given their health conditions and caregiving responsibilities. Robert was worried about long lineups for testing today, so I asked him to tell Rowan to give me a call. I spoke to him this morning. Rowan is standing right now in an eight-hour lineup at Moody Drive testing facility in the West End. The lineup is more than a kilometer long. That was not a typo, Speaker. Rowan and Kimberly are currently in an eight-hour lineup. The first person for that lineup, Rowan tells me, arrived at 4.30 this morning. Rowan and Kimberly arrived at 7 a.m., and they might get tested by 3 p.m. this afternoon. I'm being told that people are parking kilometres away and walking to the line, that they're languishing outside, some with children. Folks are turning away at the sight of this massive lineup, which means they aren't getting tested. It's unacceptable. Speaker, to the Premier. What is his plan to reduce these lineups and open up testing right now? Minister Health. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. We have set up 148 assessment centres across the province in quite short order, and are very grateful to our hospitals for doing that in the midst of all of the other work that they have to do, dealing with COVID patients and helping out in long-term care homes. But we recognize that the lineups in certain areas, as you can tell from the questions that we've heard this morning, are getting to be very long in certain areas. So we're looking for other community partners to help us with this to be able to take some of those um, lineups and divide them so that people don't have to travel far and don't have to wait hours in lineups. That is what the people of Ontario uh, deserve and expect because we don't want people to be turned away from having a test because of the length of the lineup. We are actively working on finding those partners right now and hope to have them in operation within the next few days. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. That is cold comfort to Rowan and Kimberly. Five days ago, this government heard from the financial accountability officer for this province who said they are sitting on a $6.7 billion surplus of money this government was supposed to spend for the people of Ontario for COVID response. Ottawa is one of three communities that have seen a worrying rise in COVID cases being positive, 
experts have told this government, the experts this government does not want to listen to, that its back-to-school plan is flawed, and they are exposing us right now, as I speak these words, to the likelihood of a second wave. We needed months before to massively ramp up our capacity to test in different centres of Ottawa, but this government is rather passing the buck, talking about community partners. And who's suffering? Rowan, Kimberly, and thousands of people and families in this province. Speaker, when are we going to get more than words and platitudes from this government? When are we going to get them to release the money the people of Ontario deserve? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And I say through you to the member that we are ramping up considerably our activity on testing. We have done that since the beginning. We were doing 5,000 tests a day when we first started. We're regularly doing over 25,000 tests per day. We're moving towards 50,000 tests per day. But we recognize that we need to have the centres available for people to be tested. It's wonderful that people have received that message to go and get tested, but there is work that still needs to be done. The 148 centres, many of them are under strain right now. We're looking to relieve that strain. We are actively working on that. We are speaking with other partners now in the community so that people will be able to go uh, travel a shorter distance, to find something in their own communities, where a place where they can be safely tested, and to make sure that we have the lab facilities. Again, we were only able to do about 5,000 tests only a few short months ago. We're able to keep up with that right now and to make sure that we can do 25 or 30,000 tests per day. So we are increasing as the demand is increasing. There are lineups right now, but we are going to relieve them very shortly. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa, West Nepean. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for my friend, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Across Ontario, businesses continue to show the true meaning of the Ontario spirit by providing PPE and supplies to protect people, frontline workers and communities in the fight against COVID-19. Through our Ontario Together Fund, we have made strategic investments in companies across Ontario, including in Eastern Ontario, to secure PPE and to strengthen our world-class manufacturing sector. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister please update the House on the government's latest efforts in ensuring we have the PPE we need to combat COVID-19 and to get our economy moving again? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you to the member from Ottawa West Nepean for the question and for your uh, continued advocacy. Ontario's world-class manufacturing sector continues to step up and respond with Ontario-made solutions in the fight against COVID-19. You heard the Premier a few minutes ago. We announced an historic $23 million investment matched by the Feds in a 3M N95 plant in our friend Steve Clark's, Minister Clark's hometown. Great work, Steve. Great work, Steve. Uh, 3M's Brockville plant will see over 100 million masks made each year to meet domestic demand while creating jobs, reinforcing PPE supply chain, and reducing our independence on overseas suppliers. Yesterday in Guelph, we announced a $2.5 million Ontario Together Fund investment in Linamar Corporation Spons. to help retool their assembly line to make components for over 10,000 E700 ventilators. Speaker, we continue. We're paying close attention to the clock. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Minister, for that response, Mr. Speaker, and for that update on the production of life-saving ventilators and N95 masks. We continue to rely on our world-class manufacturing sector to retool operations and innovate to produce life-saving PPE. Our manufacturers continue to step up to that challenge, and now it's our turn to do our part as well. Can the Minister please outline to the House how the government is working to help the province's manufacturing base and economy recover from COVID-19 over the long term. Minister Economic Development. Over the last three months, uh, Ontario's economy has recovered 672,000 jobs, 98,000 of which were in the manufacturing sector. But, Speaker, there's still much more work to be done. So we're pleased to support the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Ontario Made program to raise awareness and support for goods that are made right here in Ontario. This will give consumers the information they need to support Ontario businesses and to support the Ontario 
Ontario-made brand the next time they visit their local grocery store or hardware store. Speaker, manufacturers are lining up to show their Ontario-made spirit, and we encourage everyone to visit supportontariomade.ca to learn more. You heard the speaker. We're unleashing our innovators. We will never have to rely on another country again. The next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is, to the, uh, is for the Premier. Toronto Public Health has identified over 80 schools that are high risk for the spread of COVID based on the neighbourhoods they live in. 2016 census factors like lower income, multi-generational homes and racial backgrounds are taken into account. These high-risk schools have lower class sizes as a result. How is it the data modeling to determine which schools are high risk is so old and faulty that schools in nearby neighborhoods with higher COVID numbers are not on the list and don't have those lower classes? Government House Leader, your reply. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member across uh, the aisle for that uh, question. As the Minister of Education has uh, highlighted and supported, of course, by the, uh, the Minister of Health, uh, our priority remains uh, across government, and I assume on both sides of the House, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the safety and security of the students uh, uh, this fall. Uh, I, too, I have two kids who are, uh, who are, at back, at, who are back at school, and uh, in, in one of those areas in particular where my daughter is, uh, is at high school, uh, it has become a, a bit of a, of a concern, uh, but uh, the, what has been put in place by the school board, supported by the Minister of, uh, of Education, by this government, has given us all a sense of, uh, of security, but that does not mean that at any time we will let down our guard. Uh, as has been said uh, often by this, uh, by this minister and by the Premier, it is our main concern, the safety and security of the students, to make sure that they have a, the highest quality of education and that parents can be assured that their kids are safe when they go to school. Spons. Supplementary question. In my riding of York Southwestern, the 2016 census data and postal code modeling left four schools off the list that should be considered high risk based on actual COVID numbers those neighborhoods have. While on this side of the house, we believe all classes should be smaller. It is simply wrong and in fact reckless that families with children living in the same neighborhoods and sharing the same amenities like daycare are treated differently. Why are all class sizes not smaller? And why are, why are we not accurately tackling the higher risk neighborhoods that are the realities in York Southwestern and in this province? Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, just to affirm, in Toronto, they, the school board has redeployed 400 elementary teachers. They have hired 366 net new teachers for the very purpose of spacing and reducing classroom sizes. In those communities, as noted by the member of higher risk, where public health, working with the school board, the Ministry of Health and Education, have identified higher areas of community risk and transmission, those schools have uh, caps imposed. Now, remember, Speaker, for high schools right across the city of Toronto, likewise in Durham and York and Peel, the school caps in high schools is at 15 in a blended model. In elementary and those higher risk communities, specifically, the cap is at 15 between kindergarten and grade three. It is 20 for grade four to eight. And that, I think, Speaker, underscores our commitment in the context of mitigating risk. We've also hired, Speaker, over 100 uh, and two uh, public health nurses, Bonds. doubling capacity within our schools. It is a proof positive, Speaker, that we'll continue to invest and do everything possible to keep our schools safe. Question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. I want to thank the Minister for visiting Niagara earlier this week and hearing from key leaders in the tourism and hospitality sectors in Niagara. We know that COVID-19 has had an enormous impact on sport in this province and indeed across Canada. Next year, Niagara and Ontario are scheduled to host the Canada 2021 Games. I know the minister has allocated substantial investments in athletes and facilities for these games and wants them to be a great success, as do we all. However, given the importance of protecting the health and safety of athletes, organizers, volunteers and spectators alike, would the minister speak to her commitment to flexibility and support for the Canada Games in Niagara, given the COVID-19 evolving situation? 
Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industry. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And I'd like to say thank you to the member from Niagara for uh, his thoughtful question, as well as for his diligence in supporting the heritage, sport, tourism and culture industries uh, during this COVID period. Uh, as he will tell you, I visited Niagara three times over the pandemic over the course of the uh, summer, uh, first to make a significant announcement with, with respect to Niagara Parks Commission. Second, uh, to make significant announcements with respect to Metrolinx on behalf of my colleague, the Minister of Transportation, and, uh, and third, recently to, uh, to, to meet with the tourism stakeholders who were hard hit. And I would be remiss if I didn't say thanks to the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario for their lobby today, and I hope everyone takes the opportunity to meet with them. But let's get back to the Canada 2021 Games, Speaker. Uh, due to COVID-19, it is anticipated that these are uncertain times, and we want to make sure that the safety of our athletes, their coaches, their parents, their fans are first and and utmost our priority and therefore I will be supporting the Canada Games Council Fonts. if they do decide to postpone those games and we will commit uh, as an Ontario government to pursue those games in 2022 if that's required. Here, here. Thank, you Supplementary. thank you very much speaker and thank you to the minister for her response and her commitment uh, to understanding the flexibility and support for the Niagara Games. It's incredibly important and her advocacy is noticed by many in Niagara as well as her uh, many valued visits. Being an athlete during COVID-19 is no easy job. Ontario is home to some of the greatest athletes in the world that have performed at the highest levels of competition. So could the minister please tell us what the ministry is going to do to ensure these proud, hardworking athletes receive the support they need in order to compete at the highest levels on the home and international stages? Minister of Heritage. Um, as you know, we did support the Niagara Games with a $29 million investment. We will continue to support those efforts as well. Early days in the pandemic, we brought forward a ministerial advisory panel on amateur and high-performance athletes, and we were the first in the country actually to allow our athletes uh, to precondition um, at the Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario. And we actually used to have, a, in, in honour of Penny Alexiak, the operation get Penny back into the pool. And therefore, uh, we are committed to making sure that our high-performance athletes compete in Tokyo in 2021. And that's that's why last week we made an additional $21 million investment into our high-performance athletes. Wow. And I can confirm that uh, gold medalists like Penny Alexiak, like Rosie McLennan, and like Andre Degas have been supported through this ministry and through this funding so we can see them not only uh, go from the pool to the podium, but again to unify Canadians at a time we're going to need that unification as we come out of COVID-19. Sport is a unifier and this government supports our athletes. <laughs> Thank you. The time for question period this morning has expired. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.